Good morning again. Um, thanks for the invitation, uh, Eleazar. Aaron was not here. Um, thanks for attending the last session of the last day of, uh, of uh, week two. This talk is about pangenomics, a tutorial on sequence graph for pangenomics. I should really call it pangenomics for CGSI, knowing that the audience is mostly not specialists in, in I guess, you know, low-level sequence analysis, although I know that some of you are. Uh, actually, uh, specialist in pangenomics. So, apologies for you, for the few of you who would find this very um, basic. That being said, um, for those of you who are not here during week one, this is a presentation of myself and the team. Uh, for those of you who were here during week one, my microphone wasn't working during part one. <laughs> so, anyway, you will get, uh, you will still get the information now. Uh, so, I'm Ryan Chiki from Institut Pasteur in Paris. We, si we study sequence bioinformatics. That is to say, we work on genome assembly algorithm with KMERS, uh, sequence search at large scale. It was the topic of my talk week one. And today is pangenomics. Uh, this is my second talk at uh, CGSI. I'm truly honored to give this talk. There is a story be behind giving two talks at CGSI. Usually, I, um, I, I'm a bit of a lazy faculty, so I would like to give only one talk. <laughs> and, but CGSI asks for two topics. And what I typically do for talk number two is um, talk about things which are a bit more out there. So, for instance, two, uh, three years ago, I, I had a ridiculous talk title, which is whether de novo assembly was a solved problem or not. I thought they would never accept this talk. They did, and it became my most viewed CGSI video. <laughs> so, uh, today, my, my a bit original topic is to say I would give a live demonstration of pangenomic software. Uh, I hope it will be interesting for you, and let's, let's get started. Introduction. So, um, pangenomics. So, it's maybe a bit foreign concept. The way I define pangenomics is a collection of reference genomes, so fully assembled genomes, from the same species or from related species. So, you have a population of people with round or square heads. You sequence them and assemble their genomes. And the goal of pangenomics is to have a unified representation of all of, let's say, all of human genomes in some sort of representation. It can be a graph, it's typically a graph, although a multiple sequence alignment is technically a pangenome also, although it's harder to exploit. So what you will see during this session is sequence graphs that look like this. They can also look like this, but it's way more messy. I will not talk about all the downstream analyses that are performed when you have a pangenome. Typically it's comparative genomics, so finding some sort of variations, either SNPs, or structural variants in your collection of genomes. Um, should I keep the door open or does it bother you? Yes, it bothers you. All right, I close it. Oh, sure. Okay, type of pangenomes. So, in literature, you have two different types of pangenomes. Typically, if you work with bacteria, it's the right type. So, it's the gene resolution pangenome. You don't care about the bases, you only care whether your gene is present or not in your pangenome. What I will talk about is sequence resolution, where we care about all the bases in our genomes. And that's useful because we can find SNPs, we can find structural lines, and so on. Okay, so um, knowing that it's CGSI, I would like to talk about sequence, uh, human genome applications of genomics. One of them is uh, structural variant genotyping. So that's actually a high profile paper from last year where they took a catalog of many known structural variants in human genomes and constructed a pangenome graph containing all of these variants. So you can see, I will talk about what these graphs are a bit later. But you can intuitively see that each path in this graph corresponds to an individual, and some of them have some nodes, and some of them do not. That corresponds to structural variants. Then they sequenced more genomes using short reads, and the goal of this software, which is called GRAPH, is to map the short reads to the pangenome graph, and you can 
intuitively see that when a read is mapped to, to a junction between multiple nodes, it's indicative of having a variant or not having a variant when there is no map spanning some junctions. So we did this analysis and called variants using this pan-genome graph um, as with better sensitivity than classical structural variant calling, which only maps to a linear reference genome. So the, the added value to this analysis is um, to, to map reads a bit better to a reference which contains more information. It's no longer linear, it's a graph now. And so in this paper, they did more analysis, they did associations um, to apparently gene expression changes and estimated the frequency of structural variance across populations. Another application of pan genomes at human scale is to summarize base level variations for a certain loci, for a certain locus, across multiple individuals. And that's a very recent preprint called OGGIs from Garrison and colleagues, where they provide some very nice visualizations of variations for certain loci. So for instance, here um, is chromosome 4, so not necessarily too complex a region, it seems, but you can visualize a summary of all the variations you can see at a certain locus for multiple individuals, and that's pretty much the first time we can have these types of visualizations. So here it's actually, um, all these graphs correspond to the same locus, but it's different information. Here you have read depth. Um, here actually, it seems to be a degree of the graph, so it's a bit more technical. Here it's a pileup, and that's another pileup which can show you that it's really complex. So we are not talking about SNPs here. It's, it's indels with different length, um, but typically, I, be, I believe that the type of information that you don't consider when you do pop gen analysis, and yet they are here. So these new visualizations enable us to at least see it, and then later we will have automated tools to take them into account in association tests. We are not there yet, for now we only visualize them. There are more applications to pan-genomics, especially in the bacterial world. But CGSI being CGSI, we are mostly concerned in human pop gen. I will not talk too much about that, but the slides for these applications are on my webpage. Actually, all of these slides are already on my webpage if you're interested. They mostly concern SNP genotyping in bacteria, which is a whole different beast than human, and the convolution of metagenomes. So today, uh, this is a tutorial on various types of sequence graphs. And I will show you in real time how you can construct them and visualize them on a small example. Why are we doing this? So it's been a while now. Most researchers are thinking that pan-genomics is the future of single reference genomes. They have been thinking it since maybe 10, 10 20 years. So uh, it was the future of the past. Is it, is it ready yet? Somewhat. We will, you will see how ready it is. Um, spoilers, it's not fully ready. But graph construction of pan genomes is often the first step before any analysis. It's the one we will investigate. There are many types of graphs. We are not sure exactly which to use and are the current tools use usable. There is this initiative called Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, which, is, which has just very recently published a preprint where they started constructing these human pan genomes and doing some analysis with them. But mostly now the problem is construction. So we are at the early stages of pan genomics. OK, the data for today will be the simplest data I could think of for doing live demonstration. So this is bacteria. I'm, sho I'm showing you two E. coli genomes, uh, a special type of K12 and a special type of O157, also called Sakai. These are two E. coli genomes, which are visualized by this Saint-Denis plot. The first one is uh, O157 on the, on the top and K12 on the bottom. They're pretty different. There is a large inversion. And also, the O157 is one megabase larger than K12, despite them yeah. being from the same species. What is the, what is the size of the intersection of the gene of the gene? Uh -huh. uh, good question. Um, I haven't looked at gene intersection. But you know, E. coli have very different, I mean, the pangenome of E. coli is, is, is wild. Um, between two E. coli genomes, you have sometimes a very small intersection of genes. By small, I mean 30% common. Yeah. 
So these are two different E. coli. But yeah. it's a good example for pan-genomics visualization. It's much harder than human, but it's small enough that you can see things. And what tool, what tool did Oh, this tool? visualization is made using XMatch View. It's a paper from 2018. Unfortunately, I was not able to run the tool despite my best, my best efforts. So that's, uh, that's a figure from the paper. So with some efforts, you might be able to get those nice visualizations. But um, unfortunately, it's, it's lots of work. So this is one of the tools, maybe the only tool I will not run during this last demonstration. <laughs> uh, by the way, thanks for the question and feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have a question. I will also show you graphs using the excellent software called Bandage for graph visualization and manipulation. Commands used in this protocol during this tutorial are on my GitHub, the slides also. Part one, the brain graphs. So I, I don't believe they have been defined in CGSI so far, have they? No. Have they not? Okay. So you, you might probably have heard of, of the brain graphs in some bioinformatics paper. They're becoming more spread. I've been working on them for a long time now, and I'm still happy to define them for you. So nodes of the graphs are, are k-mers. So short sequence of length k and overlaps between two nodes of the graph are found by finding exact k minus 1 overlaps. The brain graphs are widely used in genome assembly for short treats, but also nowadays in bacterial pangenomics in the two leading software for, uh, for that are PyC and DBGWAS. So the software constructs the graph, but they also do association tests on, on the brain graphs. And the reason why they do it on these graphs and not anything else, it's because there is not a single reference genome for a bacterial species. If you remember this E. coli, like it's hard to describe one species using a single reference genome, so you need to construct a pan-genome of all the species in order to do association tests uh, of bacteria. So this graph can be constructed from reads or from fully assembled reference genomes. Today we will do the latter. And the nice things about the Brun graphs is that they make it somewhat intuitive to visualize variation. Because as soon as you have a SNP, it materializes as a bubble in the graph where you have two nodes at the extremities and two disjoint paths indicating the two different alleles of that SNP. So there are some good reasons and bad reasons to use the Brun graphs. They are efficient to construct, simple to define, have a rich history. However, they are typically huge, hard to visualize and hard to interpret individual chemists. Let's do a small demonstration, and that's the risky part. So I prepared some data for you with these two E. coli. So there's K12, 0157, and I concatenated them into a single file to show you that I indeed concatenated them. I'm going to display this file. Um, dash A2 is to show only the first two lines of each file. So this is our K12. It looks like this, but there are many more lines that are not shown. And 0157. You can see that they start pretty much with the same sequence. Uh, yeah, actually, they do start with the same sequence, but there are different strains. <laughs> I'm curious now, do they, do they start with the same sequence for, for long or what? <laughs> no, they don't, because you can see this is different, this is different end. Okay, this is not the same sequence. <laughs> All right, let's construct the double graph. Um, so I will use a software called BCAM that I actually contributed to writing taking an, as input those two genomes, setting a chemo size to 31, and minimal abundance of one. It should take a minute to run. Actually, a bit less. What are like, the uh, standard chemo sizes? Oh, great question. Um, so for assembly of short reads, the chemo size cannot be longer than the reads. So typically, it was below, below 100. And in fact, genome assembly was typically done at multiple chemo sizes, starting from small to, to large, large being pretty much the length of the reads. For pangenomics, though, there is no limitation because you are, as you are constructing graphs on complete genomes. So, so here I'm putting 31, and you will see that I will show you some different chemo sizes. And in fact, the longer you use, the more, inf the more informative the graph will be. But it's a, it's a great concern, and pangenomics hasn't resolved this question for the brain graphs yet. 
So then, I mean, what I have as input is a um, uni unitic file, which looks like this. You have a FASTA file with node names, some annotation about the nodes, and the sequences at the nodes. They are not cameras because they're already pre-compacted, meaning that um, consecutive cameras on the graph, which show no, um, no branching, are compacted into a single sequence. One more thing I need to do is to convert this graph into a, this FASTA file into a graph. Uh, that's done. And now I can visualize it using bandage. Actually, can I? No, I cannot because it's really too big. I don't know if you can see it, but it's 95,000 nodes, uh, 100,000 100, edges. Why is that? It's Bacteria are actually much more complicated than we thought. <laughs> if you use a camera size of 31, you're thinking that how many 31ers are there in E. coli? Pretty much the genome size, right? So it, here we have less nodes than the genome size. We don't have uh, 4 million nodes because the graph has been pre-compacted. Anytime you have a linear segment with no variation, it's compacted into a single node. But still, it's too big. Yeah, question. What, what, K, what K you have here? I, I just missed. Uh, oh, 31. So the commands are used. Yeah, yeah, the commands are used is, is this one. Ah, that explains the, the very, the, the relationship between the, the nodes and the edges, very few edges, because uh, of 31. No, you always have roughly the same number of edges as, the same as nodes. Because yeah. your genome is going to be a path in this graph, and you have less nodes than edges, well, because no, some, some nodes are repeated. No, of course, uh, less right. nodes than, than edges, right. but you would expect much more than, than like, uh, yeah, like. So there are five million, four, four point something million kilos in this, in this data set, but the compaction makes it less. It's, it's nice to construct compacted de Bruyne graph. Uh, you don't want to construct a fully uncompacted de Bruyne graph because you cannot visualize 5 million nodes, let alone 3 billion for humans. So there are, there are some nice simplification tools for graphs, which is called GFA tools. Um, I can't show all, you all of them, but there is one command called GFA tools ASM that performs compaction if you do it with dash u. And you can even simplify the graph a bit more by removing short variations, and which is what we're going to do now. And I'm going to output it um, as another graph. And now we will be able to see this um, simplified graph because it will contain many less nodes. This Five. is the tools? Or this no, this is, this is Hangley's tool. Ah. Uh, yeah. No, but you master it, so... Uh... I, I, I've been using it for a while, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry I'm not showing you the documentation of all of these tools, but no, at least you know they exist. <laughs> So what I did is run the command dash b200, and in fact, let's, let's, let's have a look at what it does. Dash b is pop bubbles. So if you remember what I talked to you about here, this is a bubble. Popping bubble means you remove arbitrarily one of the two paths, and you keep the other. So that's essentially meaning every time you have a snip, you remove one of the two alleles. And it makes the graph more linear. So now we can visualize it. I mean, it's still complex, right? So this is, uh, you, don't ex you don't expect to view anything out of it. However, you can automatically analyze it using a script. It's not that simple. It, it's, no. uh, you know, the, the, yeah. the bars are, are you know, mixed with between themselves. It's not that easy to contract uh, bubbles, no? Oh, actually, no, it's, uh, Detecting bubbles is, is actually a research problem in bioinformatics because they are not always as yeah. simple as I showed. Exactly. But the ones that are removed here are really the simple ones. Oh, okay. There are some more complex ones. For instance, let's zoom in on this one. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> so this one hasn't been automatically removed, right? So it's kept. What's going on? I mean, this is, this is some sequence that's a bit messed up. So it's 95 base pairs here. Wow. Um, and there's a few, right? So that's complexity of E. coli you're visualizing here. Um, so. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad you like it. Um, so why, why is it so, so messy? The reason why it is so messy is that k is equal to 31. Every time you have an exact repetition of 31 in your genome, then it's going to be a single node with two edges going in and out of it. So like, you don't want to zoom even in the middle, but that's exactly what's happening here. Let's increase k. Uh, okay, so this was 
the graph you just visualized after and before. So this is a big one with 95,000. I still was able to visualize it after running it for five minutes. If k127, it becomes a little bit more simple. This is more simple than this, but still messy. Increasing k to 300, you still are not able to resolve all the repetitions. So that's, that's a concern. So, oh yeah, okay, so that's, that's essentially what the graph looks like in, in text format. I think it's nice to see it once. You have a header, it's like a sound file except for graphs. You have an S line corresponding to the nodes with a segment, DNA, the abundance, the length, mean abundance, and then L corresponds to links between nodes. This is a link between node 0 and node 14,000 with, with 30 uh, overlap. This is a cigar string. Okay, part two. Any question on the bone graphs? Nope, let's keep going. Uh, v, uh, VG. These are different types of pan genome graphs. You might have heard of them already. They're called variation graphs. Um, these are the ones I was talking about at the very beginning of my talk with uh, giraffe and structural variations calling. These graphs are being used. The difference with the brain graphs, uh, nodes are still sequenced, but not necessarily cameras, and edges correspond to immediate adjacency. They no longer overlaps between nodes. So in this figure, you can visualize uh, six paths corresponding to a, a, a toy genome. So this is node identifiers, and all of these paths are summarized into a pan-genome graph at the bottom here with, with the same node identifiers and the emojis corresponding to the paths. And by just reading from left to right, you read the genome of every individual. So it's a nice condensed representation of a pan-genome. However, so variation graphs are used in software called VG, mostly for human pan-genomics. There's many visualization tools. I already showed you two. This is this one and, and the previous one, OD ODGI. It's intuitive, but it's challenging to construct that scale. The construction of variation graph is definitely not a solved problem. Uh, it either requires a multiple sequence alignment of your genome, so you can't do it for human, or um, there's a heuristic called Sequish to do it for human, but it's still very experimental. So, but, but still it's nice, let's, let's construct it. Oh, and for this, I actually don't know the tools very well, so I have to go to GitHub. So if you go to the GitHub page of any tool, in general, you can find, if you're lucky, some instructions. Here at the very bottom, there. So it requires to run minimap first, dash C to align all the bases, with the two equalized against each other, and it generates a path file, which is an alignment file. Oh, I forgot dash X to remove self-alignment. And then there's a tool called Sequish that creates a variation graph from an alignment file produced by Minimap. So, okay, what Minimap did right here is uh, align the two E. coli genomes against each other and produce an alignment file. Actually, let me just show you what it looks like. So that's, that's a PAF file. It looks like a SAM file. It gives you alignments between genomes, but long alignments, right? So here, for instance, let me show you just one line. Um, this is identifier of my first genome, but its length. This is the start position of the, of the first alignment found, the end position. This is the identifier of the same genome. Okay, so it aligns to itself at, at another position. Right, because apparently those two regions at 4 megabases and 2.6 megabases are homologous. It's a 5,000 base pairs alignment. And that is the cigar string of the alignment showing all the mismatches, deletions, insertions, and so on. If I look at another file, another line of this file, uh, this is again the same alignment against itself. Okay, well, I guess it only does self-align at the beginning. 
Okay, now this is a self-alignment for another genome, for the second genome. Anyway, this is an alignment find, and this is very tangential to what I'm doing now. <laughs> Let's run the question. And G is the output, and the which is not found because it's <laughs> here. So this is going to generate a, a variation graph. How much time do I have left? 20 minutes? Don't worry, we can add you a third talk also. <laughs> Do I get to choose the topic? <laughs> All right, so now the, the question is, is it going to be too big to visualize or not? And given the time it takes to load it, yeah. uh, yes, 300,000 nodes. Replace your Mac, your Mac is maybe... Yeah, I wish, I mean, I don't even have a Mac. Exactly, that's why I don't tell yes that you don't have a Mac. How come? Oh, How come they invited? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it to the question session. <laughs> okay, going on. So, uh, so this is too big to visualize, but I still visualize it here. It's, it's a complete mess. You can simplify it using the same trick I did earlier. It's still a mess. You can run another tool created by the same author to smooth it and, visual and simplify it a bit more. It's again a, still a mess, although less nodes. However, I, I talked to the main author of, of VG and he said, oh, but you know what, there is a tool called PGGB. If you run it, you get a nice output. And in fact, this is a nice output right here. This is a, a different visualization of those two genomes. And now you can see really the differences between them at a high scale, at a, at a, at a low, lower resolution, but you see more of them. And in fact, what is this long edge here, which is the same edge as this? Actually, this, this short edge connecting those two sections. Do you remember? It's the one million, uh, it's the one million base pairs inversion. So you can actually visualize it and identify it very nicely with PGGB as a variation graph. So these arcs uh, represent inversions? Yeah. Because. Um, Transfer are transfer are uh, the top uh, or translocations are the top uh, um, uh, figure. Yeah, there might have been some translocation in purple here, which are not visualized by VG. There is no edge from the left part to the right part of the genome, but the, the inversion is well identified. I don't know why the trans the translocations are not visualized. It's, I will talk about it a bit more later. The reason why you get a nice visualization here and not a nice visualization here is that I run the tool with default parameters, which usually is what you do when you don't know a tool. It turns out that for, for particularly variation graphs, default parameters are entirely inappropriate. So PGGB solves this by setting some specific parameters, but it's very much experimental. That's pretty much a state of the art of, vis of variation graph visualization from a few months ago. Well, it looks like a text file, let's skip it. Part three, um, I want to go fast on this one, but it's still interesting. It's actually algorithmically a bit more involved. I don't know if for the end of, two, of week two it's appropriate to, to go into the details, but just briefly, mini graph is another formalism. Sequences are nodes, adjacency has edges, same as variation graph. It's a bit complex to explain, but it's useful for uh, course representation of many genomes. You don't care about SNPs anymore with Minigraph. What you care about is long insertions, um, long deletions, essentially big structural variants. In 10 seconds, the way it works is by aligning a genome to another one using an algorithm very close to Minimap, and any part which doesn't align becomes a new node in the graph. So it updates progressively a single linear reference genome into a graph and then updates this graph with more parts that do not belong to it, to new genomes, with new genomes and so on. I'm skipping, skipping technical details over here. So it's fast to construct. It results in smaller graphs. However, it's not very well formally defined and small variants are not, are not included in this representation. However, I can't resist um, showing you what it looks like to construct because it's actually fun to construct. I mean, fun for me because it's fast. How I, ah, fun, but I actually never remember how to construct it. So 
So again, GitHub, do we get instructions somewhere? Yes, we do. Uh, this is for mapping. This is really graph construction. That's the one I'm going to use. It has some obscure parameters I'm going to copy. These parameters are really obscure. I don't want to explain them too much. And the particularity is that this time we don't give them the two equalize, we give them one at a time. And does it output somewhere? Yes. And it's particularly fast. Well, is it? I don't have a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> In my memory, it was faster. OK. <laughs> It gives me time to explain those parameters. So this is dash c, uh, x, what is x? Oh, dash c is to align all the bases, and dash x is a preset to say incremental graph generation. OK, well, that wasn't so bad, actually. Um, you know, OK, that's finished. How big is it going to be? Only 800 edges. And look at this nice graph. Let me increase the node length. This is much more simple, isn't it? That's the genome of two equalize right here. Notice, however, that something is missing. The inversion. Where is it? Huh? Well, it turns out that apparently mini graph cannot represent inversions. Because of the wave, I mean, the inversion is not exactly a new sequence, and Minigraph really updates the graph when it finds new sequences. So for him, something mapped in the other direction, and nothing to see here, I'm not going to update the graph for that. So it didn't include, a, didn't include an edge, maybe later in the future. Do you see uh, like a little bubble where the breakpoints are? Uh, I mean, I'm just we definitely see little bubbles, yeah. So that's an inversion of one genome to another. And you know what, actually, let's do something here. Bandage has blast. And that's extremely useful. I can blast one of the genomes against this graph. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to blast K12. And just for saving time, I'm going to say that uh, identity should be super high because I don't care. These, these two genomes are sufficiently similar that you might, in fact, blast one against another. So I run blast search. What it's going to do is color the nodes according to whether it's a blast hit or not. So here you see that the green part corresponds to K12, and the gray part corresponds to something not found in K12. So this node is an insertion related to K12, and it has nice, um, nice colors also. And as expected, many of the in insertions are not, are not hit, because the other genome is larger. So we visualize all the, all the insertions here. Okay. So you can see bubbles corresponding to large events. But the inversion is not found. Questions so far? No? OK, I still have 10 minutes, so I'll keep going. Uh, MDBG is the last final graph flavor I will show you. Uh, this one has been introduced, induced, introduced by me and colleagues two years ago, so it hasn't been talked about at CGSI yet. It's a De Bruyne graph that is well, it's, it's a variation over the Bruin graph. It's for coarse resolution of large number of genomes. What we do here is that nodes are no longer k-miners. They are what we call k-miners, which are k-consecutive minimizers. Minimizers, I don't believe they have been introduced at CGSI yet. They are, uh, oh man, introducing them in a second is tough. Uh, it's like a sketch of a sequence. You essentially subselect some k -miners from your sequences, but they are subselected de deterministically, meaning that if you find AC, if you decide that AC is a minimizer, you're always going to select AC. You're always going to find it in your sequences. So for instance, converting my sequences into minimizer space consists of discarding everything except some k -mers. And minimizer space, the Bruin graph, construct the Bruin graph over the alphabet of minimizers. It's, it's a bit unusual because it hasn't been really been done before in sequence bioinfo, but it's like um, the alphabet is no longer ACTG, now the alphabet is longer k -mers. So you construct k over k uh, simply. 
But it's, overall, it's nice because it enables you to visualize large genomes. That is the human genome represented as an NDVG. Okay, question over here? No? Okay. So you don't often see graphs for human genomes because they are too big to be visualized by VG, by the Bruin graphs, by mini graphs, and so on. Here you can actually show them with MDVG. It's not separated by chromosomes. Why? Because centromeres and telomeres are repeated across many chromosomes, and essentially this is why you have uh, a single point of, connect, of contact between all the chromosomes. Although some are separated. Uh, so it's extremely efficient to construct. It gives you small graphs that are easy to visualize. However, you lose base level resolution, so it's no longer SNPs. Um, most of the SNPs are discarded. But now you can visualize diploid human genomes. So that looks very similar to the previous representation I just showed you. However, if you zoom in, you see all the variations. And these are not SNPs. These are really uh, heterozygous insertions, deletions in a single individual. So, so far, this is not pan genomic. So every time you see a short bubble like this, not, don't think of it as a camera, think of it as a sequence of length 10,000. So now this is pangenomics. This is an NDVG of five human genomes. So these are individuals which are well studied nowadays, HG002, 3, 4, 6, 7. And it's very fast to construct one minute per genome. And you can see that, well, it's not so complex, right? So, so this is like, it looks like a graph of a single genome, except that if you zoom in, now you see even more variations between all of these individuals. Do I want to do a demo? Yeah, I guess I have some time. So I wrote a tool called Rust and DBG. I co-wrote it, and I never remember the arguments, in fact. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, there's a few arguments which are a bit more involved to run. So you have a density, which is essentially controlling what minimizer you use. You have a camera size, you take a two equalize, and you have to say that it's a reference genome. And abundance minimal of one. You see, it didn't take too much time to construct for E. coli. Um, I need to do an additional simplification step. Finally, two base space. I never remember this comment actually. All right, I'm going to cheat a bit. All right. And finally, we can visualize the NDBG. It's only 300 nodes. And now, what do we see? Um, now, we see the inversion. I think it's actually here. This is, I mean, there's not two inversions. I don't actually know what this part is, but it's actually common to those two genomes. So I wanted to show just one thing. Yeah, you can blast the genome of one of the two E. coli to this graph. And you can also blast the other. And can you spot the difference between those two, uh, these, these two figures? It's a bit separate. Well, did you find it? Hardly. Hardly, yeah. It's, but there's actually a difference. It's, it's pertaining to the inversion. Maybe you don't see it very well, but actually the colors of the left part switch. So for instance, take a look at this section. Actually, the colors are not very well visualized by the projector, but it's supposed to be blue. It becomes purple. What's going on is that, I mean, the first part, the path, followed by O157 is the one that goes through the bottom, do a loop, and then finish just at the top of this part. And it's the opposite for K12. It starts at the top, do a loop, and then stop at the bottom. That's exactly what you expect for an inversion. At the right side of the figure, you don't get this pattern. So there's no inversion. Yeah, all right. OK, so to recap, we've constructed and visualized a few pan-genome graphs. I hope you enjoyed it on two E. coli genomes. Some conclusion, all of them were visualized using um, the GFA file format, which is now standard for genome graphs, extremely useful. 
Um, all of the tools were written as single binaries. As you can see, I didn't have to run scripts or whatever. That's extremely useful for portability, except that they are not always distributed by the authors. So sometimes I had to download them from Conda. From, I mean, that's a bit of a pain. They're fast to execute. However, you can see that the graphs have very different resolutions. Since sometimes they're complex, they represent all the bases. On the other hand, they're sometimes very simple, but they don't represent all the, all the variations. Uh, what we can comment on each of the graph flavors of SDBG, there are many tools to construct them. I showed you Ecamm. Large K is still a challenge. And, uh, we weirdly, it's still a challenge to construct. VG is experimental, but there's more and more tools for it. Minigraph is so fast, produces tiny graphs, but it's unclear what variations are kept and removed. You would think that ins inversions would be kept. They are not. MDBG is fast, small graphs, but they are sensitive to small variations. And I didn't have to talk too much about it, but there's some caveats. I will finish with a thank you for your attention and finishing by giving you my take on CGSI 2022. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.